Okay, so my chapter um, looks at the determinants of mobility in the global south. Uh, we start with the observation that uh, persistence of economic status is higher in, uh, in the low and middle income countries for many measures that we can uh, estimate. Um, so why is it higher in the developing world? Uh, now there are many uh, potential candidates, but most of the evidence we have is actually coming from high income countries. So we could use that literature to, to have an idea, or we can think of what we know from the development literature in general of things that are peculiar or uh, characteristic of developing countries to give it, us an idea of what might explain that high intergenerational persistence. I'm going to focus on three um, domains, labor market segmentation, uh, credit and risk market failures, and information frictions. So domain number one, labor markets. Um, when in the standard mobility literature, the, the main models, you know, uh, Becker and Toms, Solon, they implicitly assume uh, a unitary labor market where uh, your skills are equally rewarded across sectors. Um, now, we know from the development literature that, that may not be true in the developing world. In fact, you have people with exactly the same skill set potentially earning very different uh, type of income. So that creates the dual labor markets that all of us development economists are very familiar with uh, from our grad school development class. Um, now, if the sector in which you end up is inheritable, then you can see how this translates potentially to lower mobility. Um, now, the point is that it's hard to identify which parts of this sort of where you end up in, in which part of the dual labor market you end up, which part is heritable and which part is not. So that's the challenges for us to, to study in, uh, in, this, in this literature. Um, what is crucial is understanding how you can create those bridges between the bad jobs and the good jobs, to use a very simplified version of what the dual labor market is. Um, so I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Location. Um, if you're born in a, a faraway area of, of a rural part or, or of a low-income country, it's harder for you to move to where jobs are and where wages are higher. So that's one potential segmentation. Um, in fact, there's evidence in South Africa, for instance, from Kali Ardington and others, showing that an exogenous arrival of, uh, of, of, in, of income in the family actually has effects on the younger, in this case was a pension for older South Africans, actually has an effect on the younger prime age individuals and allows them to migrate and look for job. This is very much consistent with uh, this type of barriers to, to mobility. Um, connections. Um, like Kunal was saying, one of the things that are very much inheritable are the connections you have that get you jobs. So um, in, in this case, again, um, uh, evidence from South Africa shows that a network-based, network um, having good networks uh, allows you to, to get better job, which again increases intergenerational correlation of status. Um, now, one point that I, I like to make, and I make it in every time I talk about mobility, is that um, the, the fact that these type of things are what increases uh, intergenerational mobility is not just inequitable, it's also inefficient because there is imperfect correlation between the kind of quality networks you have and the ability you have. So just because you have good connections, you get a good job, it doesn't mean you're the best person to get that job. So, you know, Plato in the Republic talk about this, by the way, for philosophers uh, in the room. Um, so you see how these kind of things um, increase intergenerational persistence and they also have an effect on the efficiency of the economy, meaning which people are allocated to which jobs. Okay? Um, so this, I don't have a lot of time, but this gives us quite a few potential avenue of, of future research. Um, for instance, one idea that I propose in the chapter is just it, in, in the high income literature, we're looking at this geography of mobility studies, right? In which we study, like so Raj Chetty, for instance, in the US has done this, in which you have these maps of different mobility levels around different areas. So I'm imagining something similar uh, for, uh, for variation in economic mobility across regions in the developing world or across occupational segments or across um, other type of, again, segmentations in the labor market.
Um, and this could also be uh, coupled with more uh, narrow focused intervention, perhaps less descriptive, more on the causal side of things, where we, we can see the effect of specific interventions that allow to build those bridges I, I was talking about. Um, so it could be uh, some type of uh, retraining for people who have lost a job or things like that. Essentially allowing this, or vocational education is one that often gets mentioned because it's kind of one of those programs that allows you to move from a potentially low income situation into a high paid job uh, um, situation. So those are just two examples. I have more in the chapters that uh, you can read. Um, second domain, credit markets. This has been studied in the, in the high income country literature, um, but um, the, 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 the evidence is a bit inconclusive, meaning are credit constraints that important for explaining higher persistence in the high income country? We don't know because the evidence is mixed. Now we have reasons to believe that in the developing world that might be actually very important. Why are credit constraints important? Because if not everybody is equally um, able to access credit, then you have a situation in which potentially high ability children cannot get education because their parents cannot secure a loan to pay for their education. Again, this is both inequitable and inefficient because you want the high ability children from low income families to get high education because they would contribute to society. And instead this market imperfection, credit constraints, doesn't allow that jump to happen. Um, now, we have evidence showing that this is actually the case. For instance, there is this paper in Chile uh, showing how a college, lodge, uh, college loan program allowed um, to close the gap in, uh, in enrollment by uh, socioeconomic status. So this is consistent with the credit constraint hypothesis. And also there is evidence from, from Mexico, so two Latin American examples, um, where uh, here the, the, the lower income families were seemed to respond well to an intervention that changed the cost of education, again, consistent with credit constraints. So there seems to be evidence that credit constraints do matter more in the developing world. If that's the case, that gives us a direct policy tool to do something about it. So to decrease the intergenerational persistence. Um, so now, empirically, it's kind of hard to, to measure how important credit constraints are because then you, have, you, you need the definition of who is credit constraint, and it's not empirically easy to do so. Um, one thing that we, we know is that this, whatever test we come up with should take into account what is more widespread in developing countries. For instance, many families, many more than in the high income world, don't, don't have collateral to, again, access credit. Um, in some places, uh, market penetrations in rural areas is not uh, very uh, deep, uh, which explains the success of things like uh, M-Pesa in, uh, in Kenya, where you essentially you bypass the banking sector by doing it by phone. Um, and also the uh, large number of small institutions. Those are, those are all characteristics, again, of the low-income world that m might change our definition of credit constraints. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that this, again, within the spirit of using the larger development literature to tell us something about the intergenerational mobility literature, there's a large literature on the importance of uh, cash transfers and how you know, some type of uh, jump-starting the, the investment on human capitals, but also in terms of self-employment. So again, something that would allow, uh, for instance, small entrepreneur or, put, or people who want to be self-employed to, to access loans could also have that kind of dynamic effect on, on people. So that's the link to the, again, fairly uh, large literature in development economics. Um, the, the, the other thing that it's, again, potentially uh, of bigger uh, importance in, uh, in developing countries is earnings vol volatility. Um, I don't have time to go through all the reasons why that's the case, but uh, essentially there is more volatility in the more unpredictability in your income and in your occupational uh, status in developing countries. So this, this low pay, unpredictable income may make, in the absence of credible insurance product, uh, products, may make people more um, risk averse, but also they will manage the resource in, the, in a way that might be less uh, optimal. Um, so again, this linking to, to, to the literature we know in other, for instance, in the agricultural economics literature, we know that uh, 
having a risk product, insurance products, allows people to take risks, which is good for investment, which is good for growth. The same could apply for the investment we're talking about here, which is the investment in your children. So if parents are particularly risk averse, and even if they're not currently credit constraints, but they may um, perceive a future risk on, on, uh, on, on their income, they may be less likely to invest in their children. Again, here, some type of combination of the product we were talking about before, some credit uh, constraint, something that releases credit constraints, and something that also helps in terms of, uh, of risk, might, again, improve intergenerational mobility. And this uh, is, is, is particularly important for people at the bottom of the income distribution who tend to be more prone to risks. Um, I'm going to skip on this because I don't have much time, but there is a bunch of, again, because we, I'll just say this, this, the, this first point, which is that there is zero studies on this in the intergenerational mobility literature. So if any of you is shopping for PhD thesis topics, I think this is one. Um, the last domain I'm going to talk about is information frictions in the labor market and in the education market. So, um, another reason why there may be more persistence in the developing world is that there are more informational frictions. Uh, for instance, the, the signals that job seekers use to find a job uh, may be less credible or they may be, uh, there might be more variance in, uh, in the quality of education. So essentially employers have, have much more uncertainty on which to judge the quality of different job seekers. If that's the case, and if there is more uncertainty on uh, on people from disadvantaged group. In a paper I have in South Africa, I show that that's, for instance, the case for women, where employers are more uncertain about women's skills. Then this uncertainty is, is almost a penalty on the woman job seeker in this case, right? So how, if we have interventions that can reduce these frictions, that essentially can help the matching between seekers and employers, that should help uh, mobility because, again, the friction all, all market frictions essentially are not neutral. They, the people who are penalized more about by frictions are people in the bottom part of the distribution. So anything that kind of uh, relieves uh, frictions will help mobility in that sense. Um, yeah, for instance, there is a series of, of studies in uh, largely in sub-Saharan Africa showing how interventions that lower these informational frictions are particularly beneficial for disadvantaged groups who suffer from the lack of good information because they don't have the connections. They don't know who to ask for valuable information. Last point, another type of information frictions is frictions on the returns, uh, information, in limited ability to know what the real returns to education are, right? So if, again, children of higher income parents are better informed about the importance of education, they may be more likely to acquire education. If children of lower income parents have less understanding of the returns to education, less understanding even of how to apply, for instance, to Universidad de los Andes or something like that, then you will have again a differential effect on people from lower income background versus higher income background. So interven intervention that reduce this friction will once again benefit people from lower uh, socioeconomic status families. So here the agenda would be to, to, which connects to the labor market information frictions, is to have this sort of low-cost intervention, because information, friction, information interventions are usually fairly cheap, especially now with technology. That, so you can have the, the, the direct policy intervention here is to, to, to help people get out to what here I'm calling habits of the mind of essentially getting resigned to a, to, to a life in that sort of lower segment of the market. And here the information frictions could help you figure out, well, I don't need to be here in the lower segment of the market. I can go up there. The guys up there have nothing I don't have except privilege and circumstances, as Chico would call them. Um, I'm going to stop right here.